Yeah, dear colleagues, first of all, I want to express my gratitude to be invited to this conference here by the Carlsberg Foundation. It's really a pleasure to be in Copenhagen. And uh, in the last lecture, well, my lecture will be a, bit, a little bit different from the topic than the others we heard today. We started with very interesting results from excavations. Then in the last topics, we moved towards research in museums. And thank you for this perfect transition with the Ishta, nice photos from the Ishta Gate to Berlin. Now I think it's the moment really to talk about museums, what museums should do, what museums are good for, and perhaps what we should do with museums. Because for me, science has two dimensions. One is the production of research, and the second uh, dimension is the transfer of results from research. And this is not only in the world of teaching, but this is also contributing a lot to education. And I think more than ever, museums have a very important social role uh, today in contributing, educating the people, educating society, especially in cities like Berlin, or, but there are many others also, which become more and more multi-ethnical, multi-religious, multicultural. It's important to understand how cultures developed, how they are interconnected, and as I said, museums have a very important role in that. Um, <clears throat> the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, indeed, is a very strange institution. It is somehow unique because it has about 2,000 employees and it includes the 16 national museums of Berlin. You can see here 16 museums with outstanding collections from Stone Age to contemporary art. Then there is the National Library of Berlin, 12 million of volumes. It's the largest universal scientific library in the whole German-speaking world. Then the Prussian archive, 38 kilometers of documents uh, for Prussian and German history, the Ibero-American Institute, by the way, doing archaeological research also in Latin America, and the Institute of Music Research. So all kinds of cultural heritage under one roof within one institution. This is rather strange and a little bit uh, due to German history, because after the Second World War, when the state of Prussia, who built up these institutions, didn't exist anymore because it was dissolved. There was the question, who should take care for these institutions? And then the Prussian Cultural Heritage was founded in 1957 as a federal institution. And of course, in the year of the German and Berlin unification, uh, for us, a huge work started, which is keeping us busy for 20 years, and I would guess for a, will, will be keeping us busy for another 15 or 20 years to bring the collections which have been separated together to restore the buildings, to build new buildings for new collections, and so on. What is important, but the core of our uh, institution is the Museum Island, of course. The Museum Island, world famous for its archaeological collections. And you see on the top, Wilhelm von Humboldt. Uh, he was very important in designing the first concept for this museum. Uh, and it was thanks to Napoleon who looted the collections, the Berlin collections, which at that time have been, when you occupied Berlin, in the Berlin Palace, which was just opposite of the Museum Island. And after the defeat of Napoleon, when they brought back the collections, they made the first exhibition, and then the people, it was a real wow. People said, why, what wonderful collections we have. And this was really a decisive moment then to say, we need to build a public museum. And then they started, Schinkel was the architect, the first museum opened in 1830 with the paintings collection, old masters, and also with the collection sculptures from antiquity and so on. But soon after, only a few decades after, you see below Frederick uh, Wilhelm, Friedrich Wilhelm IV, Prussian king, middle of the 19th century, he had a crucial idea because he said, we want now to use the whole space of this island behind the Schinkel's old museum to build there a landscape of museums, several museums dedicated to several cultures, period, epochs, and it should be, what he said, Freistädte für Kunst und Wissenschaft, a free space for art and science. And from that period on, the museums always have been seen in close connection with the Berlin University, with the German Archaeological Institute, and with the Berlin, the Prussian Academy of Sciences. 
Today we have the Master Plan Museum Island. That means since about 20 years already, we are restoring the buildings one after the other and have to build new ones. And this is still a process which is ongoing for another 15 to 20 years because these are really very complicated projects. We reopened in 2001 the old National Gallery for painting and sculptures of 19th century. It's a wonderful Wilhelminian building. Then in 2006, there was the Bode Museum, the sculpture collection, but also with the Byzantine archaeology, which you can see there. And then, of course, the new museum, which was standing on the museum island for more than 70 years as a ruin by the air raids during the Second World War uh, and restored by, Day restored by David Chipperfield. And when you see the design as it was before, there was a, a strong polemics how it should be restored again. Should it be as it was before? There have been very back-looking people saying, no, this, they, they, they dispersed these wonderful black and white photos and um, they wanted it back as it was. And there was a narrative, of course, in this museum. Below there was antiquity and on the top there have younger periods. And uh, when you see this, now they are destroyed in the war, these wall paintings in the, in the stairhouse, in the big stairhouse, there have been several epochs, key epochs as they considered, of human history. It's starting with the tower, big tower of Babel and ending up with the Reformation. So world history is growing and on the climax of world history is Protestant Prussia. This was a little bit the idea they wanted to give to the visitor of this museum, of course, an idea we do not want to give anymore. There's a very wonderful frieze from the 19th century from Schiefelbein, the sculpture, showing people fleeing from Pompeii and bringing things uh, away from Pompeii and handing it over to these two gentlemen here. This is one is Stühler, the architect of this museum, and the other one is Olfers, the general director of the Berlin museums of that time. This was not only a restoration project, this was a huge research project. Every hall, every wall was documented. You see here sitting endless uh, discussions and workshops with architects, archaeologists, art historians, uh, um, conservators to really decide how it should be preserved, what should be added, how can we differentiate the old, the original from the new one, etc., etc. And I think what was the result opened in 2009 was really a masterpiece of all these engaged people, a real masterpiece of how one should deal such a destroyed, strongly destroyed monument. And David Chipperfield, for example, had a wonderful idea in the Egyptian courtyard. You see two photos below how it was before the destructions. This part was completely missing. And then he lifted this courtyard to the first floor. You can see this here. And then this was opened with a, a roof, of course, a glass roof. And there he presented the portraits of the royal family from Amana. Of course, it was the period of monotheism, the short period of monotheism in Egypt. Amon, the god of sun, and it's wonderful when you see how the sun is coming in and playing with the, with the portraits, or even at night when the artificial light is going down. This is a wonderful setting, and people really understand what that means. What also is uh, wonderful in this museum is that we intentionally, when we, when we started working with the walls, we saw there are different layers, different layers of museological history also. You see this strong presentation from the middle of the 19th century when they wanted to bring the visitor immediately, only entering the hall, he should feel like in an Egypt burial chamber, something like that, before reading the first information, before seeing the first objects. And this then, in the 1930s, for the Berlin Olympic Games in 36, they thought they couldn't see it anymore, they couldn't bear it anymore, and they took it off and they painted it over with first kind of museum pedagogics, with maps, with chronological orientations, and so on. And this is quite interesting. You really have inside also a history of museological presentation, and the added part, the new parts, which have been completely destroyed in the war, they present now, of course, how we in the 21st century plan a museum. What you see here in the front is the James Simon Gallery, the new entrance uh, building. This is something which we add to the uh, 
Museum Ireland, the only building which we are adding in the 21st century because we need functions, space for temporary exhibitions, but also museum shops, cafes where people can relax before they uh, go into the next museum, etc., etc. This is very important um, uh, functions. So this was the James Simon Gallery, and then the Pergamon Museum. The Pergamon Museum, we started about three years ago, the restoration. Uh, it's a very complicated building under the roof. There are still damages from the war, which has not been corrected in the period of GDR. This fourth wing will be added. You see the, the James Simon Gallery we directly lead into this building. And of course, it will be extremely important for us because the main floor, on the main floor, you will have a walk through the history of architecture and antiquity, which is unique. First, it starts uh, with old Egypt, pharaonic Egypt, in the first floor, which will be added, the Kalapsha Gate, Sahore Temple, monumental sculptures. And then, with the portal from uh, Tel Halaf, they break, we will have a break. We are just passing this break into the southern wing, entering the Near Eastern civilizations. This will more or less will be restored, but more or less as it is. Now you will see what you saw before already, the uh, two words, the procession way of Babylon leading with this wonderful uh, uh, Egyptian blue uh, leading towards the uh, Ishtar gate. And of course, to the left, there's a sequence of halls. And then you see the stairs on the right on the upper floor. There will be all the other remains of these cultures from cuneiform tablets to small um, art and whatever. And then after the Ishtar gate, you will enter the Greek Roman world, three halls. And what is really important when you watch these pictures, when there's a chance, look to the top, to the roof, because there is glass roof. So this, the Pergma Museum, and the idea to design it was in the late 19th century. It was realized later and then finished in 1930. Now we are uh, entering the, the hall with the altar, the Pergamon altar. You see the glass roof. The idea was to create an architectural museum of antiquity. So people had space to approach the objects and really get a feeling how they have been in their topographical setting. And therefore it was important also that the daylight comes in from the top. Of course, Berlin is mostly as cloudy as Copenhagen, but and nevertheless, I think it was a good idea because people really get a feeling and an understanding. So this is the Hellenistic Hall. They will be restored, but they will be more or less as they are before. But now this wing, which is under construction now, it's closed. The north wing will be completely changed because here you will enter the Islamic Museum. And here you have the Mshatta facade, which is one of the most important monuments because of its decoration of Umayyad period, Mshatta near Amman, that means from early Islam. And when you walk through this way, uh, this walk through the history of architecture, of antiquity, you understand, people understand the connections. They understand the connections between Egyptian, Mesopotamian architecture and the Greek-Roman world. And of course, they see the traditions of the Greek-Roman world, which are continuing into early Islam. And I think this is very important to make people understand what are the connections between all these cultures. And at the very end, we are all building upon each other. And at the end, the old museum by Schinkel still has to be restored. But this, I don't know if I still will be in charge when this has to be done, because the, only the Pergamon Museum will keep us busy at least 15 years. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. It's very, really very complicated, also for static reasons and so on. And then when all the museums are connected and the museums which uh, are restored, and the museums we restored already, the Bode and the new museum, will have an underground connection. So in the buildings, we are lowering the central courtyards one level deeper and then connect them by galleries. And not only the people can just walk like tunnels from one building to the next, but they will be used as an interdisciplinary exhibition space. Because as I said, the different buildings are dedicated to different epochs, periods, parts of the world. But man everywhere where he was, was dealing with, with the same topics. What comes after death? The image of, of man or uh, systems of the world. And this will really be, or here, the, the, what comes after, after death, and so an ornament, abstraction, the art of, of memory. So 
the interdisciplinary uh, um, presentation, which will change and which include objects from other collections as well. And then opposite to the bow of the Bode Museum, you can this here, we have the archaeological center. It's already open three years ago, it was opened and because there we concentrate all the scientific function which before have been spread over the different buildings of the museums. That means the, the libraries, the research labs, the restoration labs, the archives and so on, and study collections. So everything is concentrated here in this archaeological center and um, is accessible. That we, we do guided tours, for example, for visitors who are interested to learn about, about papyri or about cuneiform tablets. We have classes there. The professors from the universities, Berlin universities, come here to teach with their students. There are special halls where all, whatever they need from cuneiform tablets or, 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 or other things, papyri will be brought and they can work there. And it's a huge archaeological library with 250,000 volumes. So this is a real, it's following the old idea of Friedrich Wilhelm IV, really, to see the museums not isolated. This is something which we lost latest at the beginning of the 20th century, very latest during the, the Nazi period and on in the post-war period. We lost that to see that museums only can work well if they are connected with research, with university, with research and teaching. That means with university and the Academy of Sciences. And this we are, of course, re-establishing. And archaeology had a very important role in the 19th century because it was on the left, Eduard Gerhard, who was the founder of the Instituto di Correspondenza Archaeologica, uh, together with the famous Torvaldsen and others in Rome. This these aficionados of antiquity, collecting antiquity, trying to understand antiquity after Winkelmann, of course, collecting it, putting it into orders, what was, what was an international institution or association at that time and later became the German Archaeological Institute. He was called to Berlin, uh, you see the old museum, as the first archaeologist and he really turned the old museum into a scientific institution. Because Wilhelm von Humboldt, you won't believe that, he was completely against that. There was a strong discussion between Alexander and Wilhelm because Alexander said we have to educate the people, we have to do research and reflect the research in the museological presentation. And Wilhelm had a completely different concept. He said no, the works of art, independent of antiquity or 19th century, should speak to the visitor by themselves, by the aura of aesthetics. But he, uh, Gerhard, brought then this, I mean, sometimes he somehow he picked up <coughs> the idea of Alexander von Humboldt and really uh, started the collecting in a way for, and for the antiquity department, really that the people could get an overview of the uh, cultures of antiquity. And here you see again the archaeological center um, we have since about 10 years now one of the clusters of excellence uh, in the Initiative of Excellence in Germany. It's the only one for antiquities and we are really including Free University, Humboldt University, the Berlin-Brandenburg Academy of Sciences, German Archaeological Institute, Max Planck Institute for History of Science and Prussian Cultural Heritage with the National Museums and also for cartography, um, cartography, the National Library of Berlin. It's really a unique concentration uh, and it was really the first time also really to bring people together and to make them work under common overall topics and after that we found it as the sustainable, sustainable consequence of a cluster of excellence, the Berliner Antike Colleague, which has several columns for qualification, we have several PhD programs. We have now in the museum a PhD program. Of course, the PhD, the, they have to pass in the university. We are not taking over the, the duties of a university, but they are trained in our museums and the museums are participating in their education, in their qualification, in topics where we really can afford a lot of, of potential and qualification. Then a research center to detect new topics in before you ask for a new cluster of excellence or Sonderforschungsbereich or, 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 or whatever, three-party funding projects. First of all, you need invite fellows, uh, make test topics and see what you can follow for then, what has the potential for a larger research project. And always combining, this we learned really, this lesson, combining always several uh, institutions, never the museums alone, never the universities alone, but together. And then of course, 
Repositories is something very important. We are producing digital cemeteries one after the other, not cemeteries, but the danger, of course, you will know that are, is existing, and therefore it's very important. We do this in the museums. We have a continuously, almost daily growing um, a digital archive of the objects, which many informations we then enter in all possible scientific and open accessible uh, platforms we have in Germany. Uh, there is, for example, the German Digital Library, where our foundation plays a crucial role. The idea of the German Digital Library is really to make all kind of cultural, material, knowledge accessible to everybody. Everybody at any time from any place of the world and it's the public but not only the public It's also researchers from student to researchers and also it's usable in school classes and so on And it makes visible and it connects uh, German cultural and scientific institutions Then we are just we just started to create in the Near Eastern Museum where the Ishtar Gate is a center for three digital uh, three-dimensional digitization uh, with all the problems we have, what to use for these models, how you can keep it, how you can make it sustainable. Um, this is something we are, as I said, just we started um, creating it and it's important for cuneiform tablets as well as for statues or for architectural monuments. Um, and this will be also a center of competence for all German museums. Then digitized objects, I mean Everybody, I suppose, in this hall is using that. And it's very important then because it gives you opportunity also to connect the different databases. We have a project, for example, with the Berlin-Brandenburg Academy of Sciences about uh, coins from Tracia, from Trachia. And we have the originals in the Münz cabinet. And they have a large, from starting in the 19th century, a large collection of blaster copies. And it's, of course, important to bring all this together. Arachne, perhaps you know that, it's very important uh, to, 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 to research on, on classical antiquity or what the German Archaeological Institute uh, is setting up now, Janos, connecting archaeological databases, which Landesdenkmalämter as well as museums, as well as research institute, institutions have, but they should be somehow really interconnected and this is done in this portal. Another topic, for example, is provenance research more and more important. People want to know how the object came to Berlin or Copenhagen or London or New York and why they came. And for example, Nefertiti, it's of course an important piece. Um, of course, we have these things here. You know this regulation of partage uh, when foreigners did excavations in these countries before the First World War. But then, of course, I even if they are legally here, we feel a responsibility to work together with the countries of origin, especially, not only, but especially if they are also in a difficult situation. We have now training programs for Chinese from Egypt, for curators from Egypt. We are helping Egypt. They are in Minya, in Middle Egypt, a city not far from Amana. Uh, they are they built already, the building is standing, a museum, then there came the revolution, but now it's, it, it's got stuck, but we have to develop it. And we, I feel, and I talked successfully with the Foreign Office, we have the, op the, the obligation now really to help them to finish this museum, to set up the presentation. These are all objects from the later American exhibitions, but this is also important. I mean, we have these things here, I repeat, even if they are legally here, at the time when they came, we have an obligation to work together. And of course, the same with Russia. You see here, the, um, when they transported away in 1945 the trophy commissions from the Soviet army, of course, we have to take into account that it was because German troops in the Second World War destroyed the vast and large areas of Russia. And um, nevertheless, it's illegal. It's against international law. But you should not forget, in, this, in the 50s, a great part of these objects came back to Berlin. The Pergamon altar was in Petersburg. There is still a hall which is called Pergamon Hall. Now there is not any more anymore the Pergamon altar. So the Russians gave back an enormous amount of important objects. Nevertheless, there are still objects, about a million, in Russian museums. The politicians never will agree, but I only can say in the last... Ten years, we created a wonderful cooperation. All these depots are accessible for us. We are doing 
um, <coughs> cooperations, exhibitions, common exhibitions. We are doing research projects. These objects are fully accessible to us. And when foreigners go to Russian museums and want to work with this material, they inform us, they ask us. I think it's a wonderful way of cooperation. But at the very end, it's, I hope there's no, not a German politician, it's not important where the objects are. They should be accessible to the visitor and, of course, also to the researchers. And then, of course, what are museums good for? I said it in my introduction. We have also to educate people. We have to tell the people why it's important to go into a museum. There was a wonderful project in the Bodhi Museum. The Bodhi Museum is really a hardcore museum. Christian sculptures, one after the other. I mean, and imagine a school class from Neukölln or Kreuzberg, 90% Turkish. Can they really be interested in such a museum? And then they made, an, with, with, with artists, a wonderful pilot project. We now got five million of euro really to expand it in a large project and include people from many German museums. The project was called Museum der Gefühle, Museum of Emotions or Feelings. And they did not say, well, this is Maria and this is Saint George, Saint George or, so, or something like that. They said, they asked the, 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 the young people, what kind of emotion, what do you see? What, when you, what do you feel when you watch at this picture, at this sculpture? And uh, what, what do you remind? And of course, I mean, Pietà is, an, is something which is very actual still, and it was really a wonderful project. And the best result, when at the very end this project stopped, and then all these young people came back and asked the curator, well, now the project is stopping, unfortunately. We want to come back with our friends and families. How can we do that? I mean, then you really see that something you reached. And this is an important step forward. We now have, you know that in Germany, perhaps you heard about that in Germany, we have a few refugees. And uh, before they are sitting around, now we have a program. It's called Multaka. Multaka is Arabic and means meeting point. So through, it's very interesting. Through social media, we, my colleagues reach them from the Museum of Islamic Art, and they invite them to get trained as museum guides. And they come in, in hordes and want to get trained as museum guides. Very intelligent, clever people. <clears throat> we train them, they start in the Museum of Islamic Art, which is so important when you are abroad to have something from your own culture there to feel at home, but then also in the Bode Museum, because they must understand also our Christian culture. And then the German Historical Museum is a partner to learn the history of Germany, the lesson of a, war, a, terif, a terif, terrible war and a completely destruction, material and moral destruction, and to rebuild a country. These are three elements of something. Of course, with that, we are not solving problems of integration or, 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 or of the refugees, but at least we can do something, and I think museums should do something. I think my time is more or less over. Let me just a few words as I started later on another project this year, what is here just opposite the rebuilding of the palace. So all the collections which have been here, the origin, they grew, of course, later, originally have been here in the palace, in the palace of the Prussian kings, and they were taken by Napoleon. I told the story, and after that, they built these museums, and of course, the, the collections have been growing and growing. But what is important, this was a decision by the German parliament, but what is important, and for this we are responsible to, inside there will be the Humboldt Forum, a place for the non-European cultures, because they are in Dahlem, um, I don't know if you know, that it's on the, very, on the fringes of Berlin, and to take, take them off from the stigma of the, of the periphery of a city and bring them back to their place of origin, because originally the ethnographical collection started in the Kunstkammer of the Berlin Palace. This is a picture of the palace, and here the idea of the parliament was to, when reconstructing the palace, but only in the curvature of the palace, the outside facades, not inside. Inside it's modern architecture and dedicated to the different functions, but it should fill the architectural gap in the historical city center. There was a large polemics about that, but it doesn't matter, the decision is taken, it's almost finished in, in the, the construction. And, but in the war, after the Second World War, it was blasted by the East German government as a symbol of monarchy, of militarism. And now it will be built up. We had excavations there because this was also the oldest nucleus of the Berlin city. And this is a section through the building as it will be. There will be um, an event center on the ground floor. There will be a research floor. And then there will be uh, exhibitions, uh, a, a, a voyage, a travel through the world. Here you see the great entrance hall. On this, 
uh, galleries. In this, there are niches. We will, in these three galleries, we will present, um, together with the Natural History Museum, the Botanical Garden, the, the cosmos, the, the idea of cosmos of Alexander von Humboldt. And then you see our really also outstanding collections, uh, the Ethnographical Museum, Museum of Asian Art. It's a little bit compared to Paris as if the Musée de Quai and the Musée Guimet enter in one building together with a research center, with an event center, with a library, and so on. And as I said, these collections came from the Kunstkammer. Uh, you see below, of course, Germany had a colonial history, which fortunately or happily was very short and not very successful. But the collections are really from all parts of the world, here from the, from the Pacific, South Pacific, Georg Foster, he traveled with James Cook and he brought the first pieces from the Pacific as the same as Alexander von Humboldt brought the first pieces from uh, Mesoamerica, a fantastic um, um, uh, Pacific collection, an African collection, of course also North America, um, here the Lenzuzela, this you see here a, a rendering from the future exhibition, but, but this is still in process of working, um, which is very important to understand the beginning of writing of written communication in, Latin, in, in, in Mesoamerica with the Maya and, of course, outstanding archaeological collections. Central Asia on the Silk Road, which was one of the first globalized regions in the world with languages, expressions of art, religions from all around between China and the West and so on. And what is very important for us, you see here just in this uh, photo, we traveled around the world. We just in two weeks will have a workshop in, in Johannesburg with participants from all over Africa, really to include source communities, as in some continents they are called, or the cultures of origin, the countries of origin. That means representative of indigenous groups, as well as museum curators, artists, from these countries to explain how we think that we should present these objects and to hear, to listen to their opinion, to their, to their recommendations, how they would like that their things are presented uh, thousands of kilometers away in Berlin. And this is really something, a great idea, because you see in these sketches of the Museum Island, and here's the palace visible, one sketch is from Stühler, the architect, the other one is from Friedrich Wilhelm IV, and they had already the idea to connect the palace with the museum island by buildings. And this old idea from the middle of the 19th century, after 150 or 170 years, will be realized. And then to have here in the center of Berlin, in the historical center of the German capital, here the great vision of the 19th century, Europe and its roots in the Near East, and then the rest of the world. And both together for us is a unique, really unique uh, concentration of cultural heritage of men from all over the world, but with unique possibilities of education, of integration, but also, of course, for research and designing new forms of cooperation and new projects of research. Thank you very much. And thank you for this splendid overview of uh, a fascinating place. Um, Berlin is, is really uh, a treasure. Um, there's so much to see there. Uh, Berlin is um, very loved, as you would know, uh, by Danes. Uh, many people go there and uh, uh, on weekend trips and of so course... It's so close. <laughs> it's so close. Um, I um, I was interested in your uh, you mentioning the, the the conflict between Alexander uh, von Humboldt and uh, and Wilhelm, the information on the one side and the the emotional approach to uh, historical objects on the other, and then um, um, I thought to myself that well okay in the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. First, uh, Alexander got right, fine, and uh, the world forgot about uh, Wilhelm's approach. But actually not, when you uh, showed us the, the Bode initiative, uh, I found that uh, extremely uh, powerful, uh, and uh, I'm I was very happy that you, that you mentioned that. Yeah, I did not want to give the impression that uh, somehow Wilhelm was old-fashioned. I mean, he had a wonderful idea, which is still valid. A museum has to delight and educate. No? And this, yeah. this, with emotion, 
tell all the stories. I mean, they had not, not been so far from each other. Mm -hmm. But the point was that Alexander had a completely, and this, yes, a completely different concept of a universal museum than Wilhelm. Wilhelm, and in this, Wilhelm was, was stronger because the universal museum, which are the state national museums of Berlin, are museums for art and culture. But the idea of Wilhelm von Humboldt, of Alexander von Humboldt, was to include all collections in the palace, from the Kunstkammer, where they originated from, also the collection of natural history and history of medicine. And this collection then went different, different ways, mm -hmm. institutionally and topographically in Berlin. They have not been connected. We will do this hour now in the, in, the, in, the, in the Humboldt Forum as well, as I said, to give at least an idea of Alexander's cosmos, understanding of cosmos, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really an interesting, it, it was really this beginning of 19th century, there are so many ideas and we are still running behind these ideas, also the, the cooperation between museums and university, I mean, everything was already invented, we just should, we, sometimes we think that we are reinventing, we are inventing things, but it's only reinventing. Exactly. Or giving new shapes, which yeah. is challenging enough, yeah. of course. There's a question down there and one more there. Son Peter Olsen from the Karlsberg Foundation. Thank you so much for a very inspiring talk and the visions here are amazing, I think. I wonder if your, uh, your idea about kind of having a, this voyage through human cultural heritage, uh, of course you're very lucky in the sense that you have things on the museum sensor uh, where you can connect the buildings. In Copenhagen, we have a lot of standalone museums, of course, like everywhere else. If you should somehow integrate them to give people the, 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 the vision of a, a long journey that, uh, where there are many interesting aspects, how could you do that without it becomes a bureaucratic exercise <laughs> so everybody kind of gains from it, the audience, the single museums? you have an idea about that? It's a very important question because, and a very good one, and we are thinking already quite a time about that, because I never counted the square meters we have, but if you, when everything will be finished, if you go, go through everything, you will be kept busy at least a week, if you are not just running. And of course, who has time for a week only for the, of course, one, one should come back to Berlin many times, but nevertheless, I think, uh, what, and the point is also, now we see that perhaps some of the collection which are on the museum island, uh, Islamic one should be perhaps better shown on the other side, but of course, on the green table you can shift museums, but I mean, when you really have to do it, it's impossible. So we, we have, we have to, to, to accept realities. But of course, with the new one, we have possibilities, and of course, when we show in the whole of Gandhara art from Pakistan, from North Pakistan, these Hellenistic, early Roman influenced sculptures, of course, we will bring sculptures from the, from the antique Sammlung to, to put them beside, just to show what was a real Greek sculpture, Hellenistic sculpture, and then what in, in, in this Gandhara culture they made out of it. So this connection we must build, but then we need other means. We, and this is also, in general, for a museum, it's very important when they are getting or, or going over a certain size to find a way to give the visitor the information that he finds easily what he wants to see. And we know that, that many visitors, only also by inquiries, we know that many visitors, before they are, even before traveling to a city, they, they go into internet and look around which museums are there, could there be something interesting for me. So I think to work with um, internet offers, with apps, is something very important to make him somehow to, to give the opportunity to see connections and to guide the visitor to different parts of this huge museum landscape, because, by the way, it's not the only one. We have the Kultur Forum, there are another six museums, there is the Hamburger Bahnhof and so on, but the visitor needs help for, or for quick orientation. I think it was Jens Stube first. Thank you very much for your very inspiring lecture. Um, you mentioned the fact that there were no German politicians present. Uh, in a way, I would have liked... It was liked a joke, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I think that if you let out, I, if, I wouldn't have minded having some Danish politician present. Um, <laughs> but you no, know, it was very visionary, and there are very many ways to, there are many questions to pose. But I was wondering what visions you had um, for a collaboration between um, the, the totality of of research and communication. I mean, the, the, the Berlin 
cosmos, you might almost say, uh, and uh, other assemblies of, of perhaps not so large, but at least comparable constellations of institutions, um, especially perhaps Copenhagen, which is so close by. I mean, whether you've begun developing policies for collaboration with uh, colleagues uh, on, a, on a, a sort of a globalized scale. Thank you. Yes, this is very important. I mean, we learned this, of course, we knew, knew it before, but this 10 years of the cluster of excellence have been very important, as I said, to bring, first of all, the Berlin institutions together. And we are having uh, this top is and one for antiquity. In the second round now for five years, we have one for art history, also the only one for art history in Germany, uh, for, for other collections. So almost all our collections are somehow integrated in clusters of excellences. There we learned this, also the international cooperation. And really, we have material culture from all over the world, as I said. We have it here, but uh, when they are, even if it's legally here, we have an obligation of cooperation, so we should really use these collections to build strong and reliable bridges into these countries by training programs, by ex exhibitions. We have no problem in sending our pieces to these countries for exhibitions on, and, or whatever. And one interesting thing, we started a provenance research project now with Tanzania. You know, Tanzania was a German colony and uh, there was the Maji Maji insurrection with 300,000 uh, Maji Maji, which have been killed by, by German troops. It's even in Germany not very f known. Mm -hmm. the, the Herrero is known, but there's a similar strategy. They defeated them, and then they pushed them into the desert where they starved. And it was really a genocide, one can say. And we have a few pieces which then colony troops collected from these, from these uh, Maji Maji warriors. And we had now talks saying, what should we do? I mean, this is something I give back it to you. There's a drum, for example, from one of the kings of them. I give it back to you. I mean, they have no problem. This is something we don't want. This is for us not legally received. And then, or the other option is that we use this, this, this uh, objects, these few objects, and tell in the Humboldt Forum the story of the Maji Maji insurrection. But not only our perspective, but also your perspective on that. And they immediately agreed. They said, yes, this is what we really want. And once I had an, 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 a discussion when we, had a, a, we have a large advisory board and there was a young man from Berlin, I didn't know him, he said, well, and at the end, with the, with the palace, is it really good to, 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 to show their African art where the Congo conference has been in Berlin, not in this building, but in Berlin, which was the colonial division of, of, of Africa. And then it was our colleague from Kenya, he stood up and said, young man, if our art and culture is shown in this building and equal to all the other sculptures, equal to what you show from Europe on the Museum Island, then really something changed in between us. And he said also, do please not only watch us through the glasses of colonialism, we had a whole history before and after. And, I, and, and whenever I talk to, to representatives of these other continents, they have no problem at all, but they want to be integrated, they want to be listened, they want to, be, they want to contribute. This is for them a, semester, a symmetric dialogue. And I think this, this institution, this new one, the Humboldt Forum, gives us really the chance to create a new symmetrical dialogue. And this can reflect back on the museum island. There is more a classical, or even there are nice museums, but more a classical way of working with museums. Because I think museums have to develop continuously. If a, 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 a museum stops developing, either in science or in, 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 in doing education, then it gets old-fashioned and, and there falls dust on it. So in, in this, this is where, in, I mean, these are just a few examples. I'm sure that if this continues, we will have later many examples and we learn a lot. And I see the, the Humboldt Forum also as a process. We are just starting to learn. And there, there I see really a, a huge chance. I think <coughs> we can perhaps have a last question. It's not really a question, it's a comment. I want to say thank you. You always fill me with hope. Um, but, and I think your last point again is extremely important that it's the openness and inclusiveness and the ability to allow yourself to be vulnerable. 
of the museums. We have certain collections, we have certain artifacts, we have certain ideas, but to actually be open and inclusive and ask other people to have opinions about them, not always feel obliged to have the, old, the whole truth by yourself, but to lay yourself open is an incredible quality in any communicative institution and one that we can only be extremely envious of. Now, and for example, another example, we have a cooperation now with an indigenous university in Tauca. This is in Venezuela, on the fringes of the Amazonas Basin. And <clears throat> first of all, when we started to get in contact, they've been quite surprised, what do you want from us? Then we invited them, after my colleagues have been there, and they're now they're really fascinated. And after this contact, they are now creating a museum in this museum, uh, in this university. They have also a collection, but they never thought about making a museum. And we, will, we are creating now together, they give us a lot of information about what to tell about the objects we have from them. And we are now working on an internet platform, so the future visitor in the Humboldt Forum, when he enters the Amazonas area, will have a chance really, it's a pilot project, a model project, which then can be, if it's good, it can be expanded can get into contact with these people directly. And I mean, this, this uh, I showed an image from the, the Museum of Anchorage in, in, in Alaska, where there are storytellers. Of course, we cannot continuously bring someone from Alaska, but um, perhaps from time to time. But you can bring this via, just through a screen. And people, I saw this in, muse in this museum in Alaska, people are, even the Americans themselves, they are fascinated listening to someone. It's completely different when you listen to an, an indigenous who is explaining this object and his world of thinking. For them, think, uh, things are, are living beings for many of these cultures. And I mean, it's a completely new way of, of looking at the world. And this is so fascinating if someone tells that, and much more interesting than just reading uh, an explanation or listening to an audio guide. And this means we have to develop and the digital world gives us a lot of opportunities, I'm sure, that's even opportunities we are still not thinking about.